Welcome to Corralling the Chaos podcast, where we talk publicly about the things you're worried about privately. My name is Angela Alea, and I'm your host. This is the event industry podcast for companies and crew, where we're going to dive deep into things like, what does our industry need that it just doesn't have? What are the things you want to know, but you're just too afraid to ask? And what are the biggest opportunities ahead for our industry? We're going to go deep and nothing is off limits. Welcome back to Corralling the Chaos. Today, we want to talk about career growth, family, and having a life in live events as a woman. This will be an interesting take given the event industry has historically been male-dominated, but we're certainly seeing that change. And so today, we've asked Tan Wells to join us given her 20 years in the industry. Currently, Tan is the VP of Client Services at Freeman. Throughout her career, she has worked as a producer, a designer, project manager for a variety of events. In 2005, Tan joined Freeman AV as a production manager, where she worked her way from managing events to managing staff to managing a branch as a director of operations. She later moved to the events and exhibit side, where she oversaw event producers. Tan's ability to bring humor and a sense of calm to the chaos of show site has earned her praise from collaborators on all sides of event planning. Welcome Tan Wells to the show. We're so glad you're well, here. Thank you. Love that introduction. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, we're excited to dive into this topic. So, you know, I'll tell you what, what prompted this topic was we got an email that said something along the lines of, you know, Hey, I'd love to hear an episode about women in the industry and how to be treated appropriately. And she went on to say she struggled with that on site when she first started and how to juggle being a woman and a mom in a male-dominated industry. And so I remember reading that and then others come in and you know how things come in waves. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you start hearing that that question often. So I'm like, you know what? We should dive in and, and talk to somebody about that. So oh, thank you for, for helping us dive into this. For sure. Well, it'd be great to hear your take so, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would love to. Um, but tell us, what what was it like when you first started working in events? Tell us what that landscape looked like then. So it started a long time ago, uh, but I was in college and I was very fortunate that I started at the Center for Performing Arts as a stagehand, you know, slinging cable, focusing lights, doing whatever was needed, unloading trucks, the whole bit. But the leadership there was sort of mixed male and female. And so I think that representation in leadership is really key. And I kind of got my footing before I realized it was a male dominated industry, right? So I was very fortunate in that. And I had that confidence, which I feel like is the thing that is needed to demand appropriate treatment sometimes is to feel confident in your skills and know what you know right because sometimes you feel like wow did i make a mistake did i deserve that comment and what you said from from your listener makes me think a couple things there's different ways to be treated appropriately if there's a harassment issue i I don't feel like that's what we're talking about today i don't feel like like an hr level harassment is what we're discussing that's a whole other ball game, which there are appropriate avenues to take that. I feel like this is more like the microaggression, like, hey, sweetie, you're going to break a nail doing that sort of undercut kind of comments that we get in the mm-hmm. field. Did you get comments like that in the field? Oh, sure. I mean, okay, interesting. Well, that's why we're doing this yeah. segment, right? And uh, I, um, some of them are jokes, like, and I think as the person working What is your relationship with the person who made the comment? What is their attitude? What is the attitude of the environment? Are they saying this to be funny? Do you have the relationship already with them where like it is funny because it's like a joke between you? Like there's so many layers to this, right? But what's crazy about our industry is it's all about teamwork. But a lot of times we show up and have to accomplish things in a team that we've never met before. And so you don't have that depth of a relationship to have that familiarity. And so you have to be careful with the kind of comments that you make to people. And they just really shouldn't be about people's appearance or their gender or about any of the things that, you know, is on the list of things you can't control about yourself, right? It should just be uh, until you get to know people, professional level communication 
So in terms of being you know, treated appropriately, treated with respect, treated like the other crew members, given tasks that you can do, can you do this? Yes, you can do this. Okay, if I've said I can do it, believe me that I can do it unless you're seeing something that says I can't, right? Um, yeah. So anyway, when I started, I was in a very positive environment, so I was very lucky for that. But then as I moved on to other venues and other locations, like, oh, there's a lot of guys. <laughs> it's all I got. Um, and so you get little comments, and I think there's always a calculus of when do you speak up, and it's really important to speak up. What does speaking up look like? If you get the kind of comment that bothers you, I don't think it's profitable to turn around and just tell that person in a public forum that that they just offended you because you then embarrass that person. That doesn't get you very far. That just sets up a negative relationship with that individual for the rest of your time working together. When I've had incidents later in my career that have bothered me, I've taken time, gathered myself, like written some notes about like what was it that bothered me, gone back to that person and said, hey, I need a minute. We had this interaction. You used this terminology for me, like, hey, sweetie. Or you said this thing that undercut my position that was gender based. I'm not comfortable with that. And I don't think you meant that. Give them a chance to like say they didn't mean that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I do think, I mean, I think you're right. You know, I love the fact that you're saying, you know, don't do it in public because call me an optimist. I am, I always will be, but I genuinely don't think that the majority of these circumstances, there's ever any ill intent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anytime I've, I've kind of approached somebody with something similar, you know, it, it, it's a delicate balance, right, of trying to not make them uncomfortable, but letting them know they've made you mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And I think every single time that that's happened, they've apologized, they've been mortified, no. right? Like, because it's not it's ill the majority of the time. And so I think that's a big part of it, too, is being able to have those one-off mm -hmm. conversations and kind of get to a yeah. good place together and then be able to laugh about it right. and keep moving. Most of the time, that has resulted in someone apologizing and our relationship being strong, fine, moving forward in a way that that doesn't happen again. And I think it's important, especially if you're in a position of leadership, right, that you do those things because if you can't do it for yourself, how are you going to do it for other people? Sometimes it's actually easier to do it for other people, right? It's easier to take a stand for somebody else. You're like, you didn't treat this person right. Like, fix that. Then to like come up and say, you you offended me. Like, it, it can actually be harder for yourself. So I think you know, doing that hard work, there are times to let it go too, right? Where you are on a site for one day and you're not going to see that person again. It's somebody that's not going to have a big effect on your life. It's somebody maybe who you can tell is just set in their ways and it's not going to change, but doesn't impact you. Maybe in that case, you can inform someone like you or someone with Lasso, if you're working through a company with Lasso, right? You know, there's other avenues that you can take. So you think through those things um, to, to address the situation. I agree. We always say around here, one of our values is believe the best, mm -hmm. right? Which is assuming people have good intentions and right, like you, you got to kind of pick your battles and, and assume that there, there's no ill intent. Um, you know, suggested. Well, tell me when you talk about leadership, did you, when you first started, did you have any women role models? Yeah. So again, going back to that first environment, I did, I had women leadership there and, um, they were, they were really great as women. Um, there was like four folks who kind of ran that center for performing arts. The two women were Gretchen and Lee, and they were great role models. Um, just, showing that women were in leadership roles and they were great leaders themselves. They were trying to corral a bunch of college kids. So, I mean, their, their lives were not easy, um, just trying to get the work done. But they really taught us to be professionals along with the couple guys that were there working, Tom and Dave, um, show up on time, which is 15 minutes early, label your cables, you know, take instruction from the visiting crew, like all the stuff, right? Like it, it was how to work in the field and they, really created great crew and we're we were very proud that we got complimented right with these crews that didn't want to come in and work with a bunch of college kids over the road teams that they were like what is this and then we impressed them right so like that was kind of like our thing 
then. And so they modeled understanding, they modeled um, collaboration, they modeled listening, which are, you know, in academic research, sort of classically feminine attributes in leadership. And those were not always so well accepted. Now we see those, right? When you read your leadership articles, it's like, oh, everyone needs to collaborate. You have to listen, you have to be empathetic. 20 years ago, that was just coming around, right? I will also say I've had some male role models who have used those skills and traits. And I commend them because that wasn't always acceptable for men to do those things. And they made space for female leadership to come and take its place where it, where it should be as it is today, right? So I had those women who were really impactful in my life at the beginning of my career and then had the opportunity to work for some men throughout my career, specifically a gentleman named Bill, who I worked for. Um, I was working for a college and he was just the most empathetic leader you could imagine. And I thought, oh my gosh, like this is the kind of leader I would want to be for my staff. And then you could see that really opposed to these other guys that he was leaders alongside who were get it done, go, 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 more aggressive, more dictatorial. I don't say they're dictators, but you're just like more um, command yeah. and control, right? That is sort of classic. Um, so that, and, and then some men that talk very openly about their family lives, which I think also makes way for female leadership. So we've, I've had some really great role models that allowed space for female leadership as well as female leaders. You know, at Freeman, we have Carrie Freeman Parsons, who's our chair and a member of the Freeman family. So, I mean, that's like my ultimate <laughs> role model. She's been a role model since joining Freeman, um, but also a number of strong female leaders through Freeman. We started in, I think, 2005 with an internal uh, diversity initiative to increase female leadership, which we're now about 50% female leaders because of that. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, but you know what? You're right. You you bring up a good point. You know, when it comes to being empathetic or talking about your family, that's not a, a male or female thing, right? Both are great things to bring to work with you. Bring bring your empathy, bring your leadership, bring your listening, uh, bring your family, right? There's no such thing like in my world, th there's no such thing as work-life balance. They are all one and the same, right? They all kind of, that's just the world we, we live in today. And so um, I think bringing your family to work, right, your whole self to work, and that means I have a family and I'm a mom or, you know, the, the, the men to say, yeah, I'm a dad and I'm a husband and that's important to me. You know, I think it's, it's okay to talk about whether you're a male or a female. I think those are just good things to do because I think it lends itself to authenticity, which um, I think is a really strong component of, of good leadership as well. Um, yeah. So you talked about talking about your, you know, being able to talk about your family. Tell us about your family and how you juggle having a career alongside a family in an industry that um, is really hard <laughs> yeah. to, to yeah. do. It's a wild industry. Um, so I have a husband and I have two boys. They're 11 and 13. So we've made it this far, which is yeah. a success in and of itself. Um, so you started your family while having a career in events. Yeah. Yeah, and I will say that I made the transition into like leadership, leadership so that I could have a family, right? So you do make choices along the way. Women who are considering like a leadership role now will ask me about that and I say, yeah, if you're in leadership, you get a little bit more control of your life. You can make a little bit more, you work all the time, but you work a little bit more on your own schedule, which mm -hmm. means that you can construct that around maybe some of your kids' needs. I'm a big believer in it takes a village. I mean, you just can't because do it, it does. without support. <laughs> Let's just say it because it does take a village. <laughs> it takes a village. You cannot do it without support. And I think the supportive partner, whether or not you have kids, right? Like so some people are going to elect to have children. Some people are not. Mm -hmm. Regardless, you have a household that you live in that you maybe have a house plant. I mean, something needs to get taken care of, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to have a supportive partner who is, not just like verbally supportive, but actually is supportive to you. Even if you're on your own, you might need, you know, family nearby, take care of that houseplant with you, pet sit, like yep. whatever it is in your life, you need support. And so 
I think what's interesting in our industry is sometimes we used to see like those lone wolf kind of people who are just on the road all the time and didn't really seem to have, you know, a, a developed home life. And it's like, no, I think, wh what are you doing? Sometimes that became the road family, which is really great to see also. Like that's yeah. nothing wrong with that, right? You and people right. who work together all the time, support each other. And that's wonderful. I've seen really close um, relationships between crew and then you start to support each other, um, becomes like family but you need those connections right it's it's, yep. it's those human connections those deep relationships that help us outside of work work is not everything so wherever those are coming from it takes time and effort to develop those just like it takes the time and effort to put into work so that is key to me that you get that support we didn't have family here when we started having our kids mm -hmm. and so it was some friends from work. It was some friends from church. It was some paid support. Like sometimes you just yeah. need to find quality help that you can pay babysitters or, you know, whomever. That, yeah. So. Just to bridge the gap. I, yeah. I hear you. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think to be in this industry, whether you're male, female, have a family or don't to your yeah. point, right? There's, there's obligations, whether it's pet sitting or, or just, it's just life, right? We all yeah. need that village. We all need those connections, certainly in this industry where it's not a Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, and, and that makes it hard. And you know, we recently had um, Nate Nicholson on to talk about, you know, life of traveling and he's got, you know, a number of young kids and, and he talked a lot about the same things that you're saying too, right? Where he's got a wife who's supportive, he's, you know, has certain things and a framework set up where he's very intentional about when he's on the road versus when he's at home. And mm -hmm. so I think at the end of the day, we all just do the best we can. And we got to surround ourselves with good people who are supportive of us as well. And in turn, we've got to be supportive of them. And so I think that that connection um, and building that community around us is certainly key, especially in this industry. Maybe like a decade ago, I had a new staff member come to me and say, how do you balance everything? And how do you travel? And how do you like, how do you have the whole family life thing? And I didn't think through what I asked her to do. I asked her to go talk to the guys in her department who were, she was like one of two women out of like a dozen people to ask how they did it. And the answer they gave is we have wives. <laughs> God. And I, was, I knew in that moment, like I lost her, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's one of the differences between men and women and, and a decade ago too, that as much as society is evolving, a lot of the home life organization still falls to women. And we don't have wives usually. I mean, some of us do, but <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> there could be two wife families. Yeah. Um, but it's not that easy of just like, I've put everything on this other person usually yeah. for a yeah. while. Um, and so I do ever since that moment, that's when I've really come around to like the village idea and like you need support systems and it's, it's about the multitude and it's not one other person. You're just going to need help from your friends, your family and your partner, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, however that, that plays out. Cause that was really instructive to me that Maybe the guys aren't going to give the best advice. Right, the right. But, it, you know, it's also on us, too, to know when to say no to things, right? To mm -hmm. not overcommit, to do a good job prioritizing things, right? Because, I mean, you're in a leadership role now. Mm -hmm. And as leaders, there's a lot that's put on you, right? And so sometimes you might have to delegate, right? Or you might oh, have to... Sure. Right. And, and I think that's part of it, too. And I think as um, women, or at least I'm not going to say all women, I'm, I'm going to speak for myself. Sometimes it's hard to say no. And we try to be everything to everybody. And at the end of the day, we're really bad at all of it. You know, I always laugh because it's like, you know, my value system is I'm a wife first. I'm a mom second. And everything else kind of falls behind. Right. With work being a big number three. Um very few days do I practice that, however, even though that's what I aspire to do. Um, there are a lot of days that I am all in on lasso number one, and then maybe my kid, and then my husband, and then there are other days I rock being a mom first, and then, you know what I mean? It's just this, yeah. it's just this ever-evolving um, challenge to try to do that, and I think, I think that's okay, and we don't have to be 
perfect all the time. We're, we're not ever going to get it right, and I think that's okay. I think that um, having the judgment and the grace that we give to ourselves to say, you know what, it's okay, and also surrounding yourselves with people who are supportive of that too. Um, I just, I just think that's life, you know, and we can't, we can't rock every job like a rock star every single day, like we want to. And I think as soon as we realize that that's just not possible, things begin to come together. It's okay. And it's okay to like tell people your priorities, right? Because I do think that again, even though things are changing in the world, there are a lot of assumptions. Mm -hmm. If you are a wife, if you are a mother, if you have a job, if you are, if you have a job and your husband has a job. There's a lot of assumptions that people put on about what that means. And maybe that doesn't mean the same thing to you. And so maybe you have to say, well, no, um, actually, dad is going to take care of those things. And then, like, move that person over there, right? Or like, no, th this one's mine and that one's that other person's. Or like, actually, you know what? My mom takes care of that for us. And like, we're going to, you know, and it's that delegation that we do kind of sometimes feel guilty about in our personal lives that it's okay, but you have to, again, speak up for yourself. And sometimes you're like, oh, am I supposed to do everything? Yeah. Well, what advice would you give to women who are considering a career in events? So to any person considering a career in events, I would say look really hard at the lifestyle because of the things that we've been talking about. It's long days, it's gritty environments, it's physical work, it's grueling, you know, but it's also super rewarding because you, at the end of the day, turn around and go, we built this. And it's really cool. Anyone we bring in from outside the events industry, we always kind of say, eh, it's gonna take six months for you to figure out if you like it here, right? Mm -hmm. um, in that time, do you like that? And do you have the support system that would let you do this, right? Yeah. I think it's exactly what we just talked about. I had no idea, no idea when I was in college. You know, you're in college, you're like, oh, this is fun, I'll do this. And, yeah. You know, maybe a parent or somebody steps in and like, oh, this seems like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it it's is. fun. And yeah. then like, you kind of like construct it as you go. And I think now we kind of have some tools to tell people coming into the industry, like, hey, it's a little crazy. And like, here's what it's actually like and what you might need to know. So just, you know, eyes wide open. Do you have yeah. the support system? Do you want to live this kind of lifestyle? It's a lifestyle job. It's not just go do it. You could yeah. totally earn the same money doing something else. Uh, yeah. This is, if you love yeah, it. You're all in. Once you're in, you're, you're mm -hmm. all in. There's no such yeah. thing as dipping your toe. Exactly. Yeah. Because it gets you. Yeah. Well, you've clearly moved up over the years um, into management roles within Freeman. So what do you think has led to a successful career in events for you? You know, being willing to do the work, you know, you get on site and you're willing to jump in where it's needed in the planning, you jump in where it's needed. You're willing to speak up, listen to people, speak up for yourself, for others. I think those are the things that have led me into leadership. Um, I, I naturally organize things. Like I joke that if I won the lottery, I'd still like organize events because it's all I know how to do. <laughs> like I yeah. just naturally organize things. Um, so I mean, that helps for sure, but I do think it is those actual like sort of, uh, feminine leadership qualities that we talked about earlier that it's trying to listen to people, give them what they need. I work for a great guy who always said, give people the tools and get out of their way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like to be able to do that. And then people respond well. And when people respond well to you as a leader, you, you get more people, you get more responsibilities. Um, so being willing to do all of that as well, not everybody wants to do that. We talk about women in leadership and there's sort of a lack of women CEOs when you, you know, read about that. And, um, and part of it's knowing what you want to take on. Part of it's that saying no. And like, how much do you want to take on? How much responsibility is enough responsibility to balance with what you're doing in your own life? And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy with where I am luckily and, and yeah. enjoying the, the things that I've gotten to do. Yeah, well, you've clearly paved a great path for yourself. I mean, Freeman is, um, they're just doing some great things. Um, they're Super they're insane. known for, yeah, certainly supporting women um, as well. And they, you know, yeah. their fingerprint is on all sorts of things that um, are just fascinating and great. So they do fantastic yeah. work. And so good for them for creating the framework for people mm -hmm. like you and for other strong leaders to step in and, and do their thing as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so congrats to you. Oh, and thanks. thank you for being on the show. I think there's a number of, of takeaways we have today. I think, you know, first is it, it takes a village, whether you're a male or a female in this industry. To be in mm-hmm. this industry, you have to have a support system, number one. Um, number two, I think specifically for women, we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace and realize we can't be everything to everybody at all times, which I think is is really important. And then I think also, you know, just being a woman in a male-dominated industry, um, having the confidence of knowing where to draw the line Mm -hmm. and then having the courage to know how to maneuver through it in the right way, which is, I think, a really important point that you made. So um, for any women out there considering a career in events, it is a fantastic ride. Um, there's so many great things. I think more and more women are joining. Um, the reality is our industry, we need male and female. We need all sorts, right? So there's with 38% of the industry leaving during COVID, you know, we hope that so many of you are considering a career here because it's such a great time and chapter in your life to get to participate and create really cool things and the satisfaction by doing that. And yeah, you do get to make really good money too along the way, which is, which is not too bad, Um, but lots of good nuggets in here. I appreciate you all joining. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe for anybody who has questions or comments, reach out to us at podcast at lasso.io. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tian Wells for joining us today and sharing your story with us. I really, really appreciate it.